Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Tenth chapter of Hebrews, uh, and and what a wonderful portion of Scripture, uh, and and it really doesn't get, uh, I don't believe, the attention that it deserves come Christmas time, and and we're focusing our attention on some of the things that the Bible does say um, uh, about the birth of Christ. Of course, we don't find in our Bible anywhere uh, any instruction to actually commemorate. The, uh, the, the birth of Christ. I'm reading uh, a book I'm reading right now is all on church history, uh, and I'm a good way through it. Uh, and it's amazing how many things human beings determine and decide to commemorate. Uh, and if you look through some of the, some of the older uh, faiths and or religions or religious groups, you'll find out that very often there's a date, and we're not even aware of it. But this date commemorates Saint so-and-so. And this date commemorates, we were talking earlier this morning, Cornelius the centurion, who we read about in Acts chapter 10. We don't read about him again, but history says, uh, documented history says, he was the second pastor at the church of Caesarea. And the Anglican Church of England has the 4th of February set aside to commemorate his life of service to the Christian church. See, there's a lot of things we commemorate. Well, that's how Christmas started. Christmas started by a group of people who said we should have a mass, the mass of Christ celebrating his birth, celebrating his coming to the earth. And that's why we have Christmas. And so uh, very often you see uh, bumper stickers, posters, uh, greeting cards, uh, billboards that say Jesus is the, help me, reason for the season. All right. Well, <clears throat> it brought a question up to me. Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, that means Jesus is the reason for all the lights, all the backed up traffic, all the empty shelves. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus is the reason for our celebration of this particular day, commemorating his birth. I'm good with that. Uh, so if Jesus is the reason for this, then what's the reason for Jesus? He's the reason for the holiday. We have the holiday and we look up and say, well, Jesus is the reason. What's the reason for Jesus? Why did he come? Tells us right here in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, and, and it starts off talking about the, uh, the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament law, there were always sacrifices. I am so glad for one. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I know for one person, I am glad to not be under the Old Covenant. Yeah. Not be under the Old Testament law. To not be one of the Old Testament believers who for 4,000 years, now all of that was not under the law. The law didn't come into place until the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. So people like Noah and Enoch and Abraham... Uh, and Isaac, and Jacob, and, and Rachel, and Sarah, uh, and Joseph, and, and the other uh, brothers of his, uh, all the way up through uh, 40 years of Moses' life, uh, they didn't have any Old Testament law. They didn't have any covenant with God. Abraham had a covenant with God, but it contained no commandments. It contained no laws, and regulations, and statutes, and rules that were recorded and written down. That didn't come till the 20th chapter. But for those 4,000 years, when the law of God did come and the requirements of God were set down, one of the things that he identified was called sin. Sin is not a dirty word. It's not a bad word. It's just what God forbids, what God denies, what God states denies our exercise of what God states is unacceptable in his sight. Things like lying and stealing and murder and adultery. And, and he said those things are sin. Well, we see in the New Testament there are other things that he forbids. Uh, he says don't worry. Rather, trust him. 
Uh, and, and, and so when we have to gauge right from wrong, acceptable from unacceptable, we have to read through our Bible and say, what does he say is acceptable, what does he say is not? Now, whether or not you're consciously aware of it, you're doing something right here that he says is right in his sight, and that's attending church, a church service, uh, a time when the believers assemble together. Because his word said, do not forsake doing that as the habit of so many have, have become has become. Uh, and, and so sometimes we do things without even consciously being aware of it that are right in God's sight. Isn't that wonderful? And then sometimes we do things that are right in God's sight just out of habit, like being cordial, you know, just, just opening the door for somebody, smiling and, and, and saying please and thank you and being respectful. We might not be, be consciously doing that. Well, I did that because it was the will of God. We, we just may have developed and we just do that habitually. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with doing right. Uh, but then there are other times we're just going to look at someone who just desperately does not deserve forgiveness. And we're going to forgive them anyway. Because it's right in God's sight. We're going to walk in love to some of the people that are not lovely. And we're going to do that because God says to. And it's his will. And so we do those things consciously and on purpose. In any way, it's right in God's sight. It's God's will. In the old covenant, once the law of God came, sin was identified in the thou shalt's and thou shalt not's, as well as all of the other rules and regulations and things that the law contained. And the law did not contain 10 commandments. It contained 632. There were 632 specific commandments plus rules, regulations, statutes, and ordinances. And it was not possible. The book of Galatians says it was not possible for a human to keep all of those. That's why the, the, the intent of the law is to show us our need for a Savior. Show us our need for one who's not human, or at least not only human. He was every part man, Jesus was, but he's also every part God. He's God who became man, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, this portion of Scripture in Hebrews tells just a little bit about the law, the law and how they had sacrifices. But those sacrifices were always animals. They were a bull or a goat or a heifer or, or very commonly a lamb or a turtle dove or two little turtle doves, sometimes uh, based on what the people could, could, could afford. If they couldn't afford a lamb, didn't have a flock, they could bring two turtle doves instead. That's what Mary and Joseph brought at the sacrifice of the dedication and commitment of their new son, Jesus. That's what they brought to the temple. And, and sometimes based on the severity of the sin, there was a different sacrifice that was required. But there was one sacrifice made in the year 33 AD on the cross of Calvary that was the last and final sacrifice, and it was not an animal. And this is what it says. It says they never would cease to have been offered if they were perfect. Verse 3, those sacrifices made cause a remembrance every year. When the sacrifice was made every year, that's a remembrance of sin. Look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Now, what did the blood, what did the blood of, of, of animals do? The blood of animal sacrifice, what did that do? Now, I, I've, just got, I've just got these reading glasses. I'm going to set them right out here, and, 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 and there you can see them. They, they, they sit right there. See them? They, 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 there they are, and they sit there. And now I'm going to do something that the Bible says the Old Covenant sacrifice could do. It could do this. All right, now you can't see it. It's covered. The blood of those bulls and goats and heifers and lambs, it covered sin, but it never took it away. It covered it, but the remembrance of it was still there. Now, if I take that away and you take the substance away and it's not even there, that would be an example of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. His, his sacrifice washed us, 
cleansed us, removed the sin actually from us as if it never existed. You will be, though your sins be as scarlet, you will be whiter than freshly fallen snow, is what Isaiah prophesying of that coming sacrifice said. So it says here, it was not possible, totally impossible, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Just covered it. Just covered it. Therefore, when he came into the world, that's why we're reading these scriptures this morning, because this talks about when Jesus came into the world. Now, Jesus didn't come into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. He was already in existence. The Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the 13th, 14th verse in that same chapter states that, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh or became flesh, depending on your translation, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he, he didn't come into existence the morning he was born. You and I celebrate birthdays. We had two of our men up here uh, earlier this morning. One, he turned 60 today. And he was celebrating glory to God. Help him. No black balloons for your husband. All right. All right. And another of our men who turned 57 today. And we had him up here, and we, we prayed for him. And, and, and we go back in our life, we go back, and, and we identify with that day. Now, I don't remember if I was late or early or right on time or whatever. Uh, I always chuckle about that because it's all a shot in the dark anyway. It's a guess. You know, well, here's your due date. Uh, and and uh, uh, I always say your due date's when they're born. They were due. Uh, but we call overdue, or sometimes they're early. I don't remember what I, what, what, what I was, but, but, but we go back, and we identify with that day, and for that identification for me was the 30th day of January. And in the year, it was 1960. So I can say, well, that's the day I stepped into life. That's the day I took my first breath. And, and that's the day uh, um, I'm hoping to celebrate my birthday again. I'm hoping my mom will make me a German chocolate cake like she did all those years. Glory. Uh, and, 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 and that's the date that we identify with. But this isn't the day that Jesus came into existence. This day he was born into flesh. This day he was born into humanity. But he preexisted with the Father. In the beginning was the Word. He didn't come into being at this point. See, something happened in heaven. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to a speaker on Christian radio. He was talking about, wonder what happened on the first Christmas Eve in heaven before Jesus came to the earth. I wonder what they were, and, and they, were, they were alluding to maybe some things happened. This is the only scripture we have about what happened in heaven. And it's right here in John, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10. And it says that it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said. So we know when he came into the world, he, he did say something. There was some conversation. What was it that he said? It's recorded in Psalm chapter 40. It's tucked right in there. If you read right through it real fast, you might miss it, as so many of the prophecies of Scripture are. But this is what he said. When he came into the world. Now, that's not in, that's not in Psalm. You won't find that in Psalms. But you find it right here in the book of Hebrews. When he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering. Now, that was the bulls and goats we just read about. Animal sacrifice. Sacrifice and offering you would not. That's not what you wanted. But a body you have prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you hast had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. And so if we look at the reason for the season is Jesus, then we look at, well, what's the reason for Jesus? Why did he come? He just told us right there. It's right here in the Bible with us. The reason he came is because that was the will of God. The reason he came is because it was God's will. And so from what we read here in Scripture, 
first quoted in the Psalms, now, now shared with us in the book of Hebrews, up in heaven, and, and, and the Bible says he, he's at the right hand of the throne of God, he's at the right hand of the Father. He said to God the Father, he said, that's what it says right there, he said, sacrifices and offering for sin you had no pleasure in. You had no pleasure in burnt offerings and, and, and animal sacrifices. That's what was instituted. But he said, prepare for me a body, and I will go, and I will do your will. What brought Jesus was not our sin. It wasn't our decrepit condition. It wasn't our need. What brought Jesus was God's will. What brought Jesus was God's will. It was not human beings' prayer or intercession or fasting or crying out to God that brought Jesus. If you read your Bible, you will find exactly the opposite. No one praying, no one fasting, no one crying out to heaven. Everybody just going around about their business. Can you imagine? Stop and just, just if, if you haven't already sometime, just stop and think about how, how casual everyone received the news that hurt it except for the shepherds who ran right down to sea. But the Bible says they went out and told everybody, not one person came. Not one person that they told about. Not one of them. Not one. They were busy. Come on, it was Christmas Eve. <laughs> no, they had their lives. They were in bed. They were asleep. They had their jobs. Even the shepherds, they didn't expect it. They were just out doing their work. Nobody, nobody, not one single solitary person except for this young girl that the angel Gabriel had appeared to. And this man that was engaged to her, who he'd appeared to in a dream. And it looks like us, looks to us like they told no one else. Elizabeth, John the Baptist mother may have been the only human being to know. Everyone else just went about their life and went about their, their busyness and went about their activities and, their, and everybody was just doing what they do every day of their life. And God came to earth. And no one knew it. There was a bright outshining of the glory of God which some wise men, we don't have any idea how far away, maybe thousands of miles saw. There were shepherds watching their flocks by night, not by accident, by the design of God. And they saw the angels coming through. And the angels were the only one excited about it. I think if we could see through the veil, I think if we could really see through the separation of the temporal and the eternal, I think if we could see outside of this three-dimensional world that we live in, and we could see the things that really excite heaven and really enthuse all of the inhabitants of heaven and the things that the people on that side are really interested in and consumed with. I think we might question all the things that we're really consumed with and excited about and enthused about and with. I think it might change us. When he was born, there wasn't one person that shouted, but all the angels shouted. There wasn't one person singing, but angels we have heard on high. There wasn't one human being that came out and said, I knew it, I knew it, and we've been praying for this. But the angels, they'd been expecting this, and they did, and they did. The people that were bringing this Christ child, they couldn't even find a place to stay overnight. They couldn't even find relatives to stay with, to birth God into the world. No, Jesus said, Jesus said, Lo, I come, as it's written of me in the book, to do your will, O God. To do your will, O God. Now, if you think about the life of Jesus, Jesus here in heaven, Philippians chapter 2 tells us, pre-positioned, at the right hand of God the Father. And when he said, I will go to do your will, your will, I will go do your will, prepare for me a body. Philippians 2 said before he could come, he had to lay aside 
stripped himself, the Moffat translation says, stripped himself of his glory and rightful dignity and descended into the human race and entered the human race like every other human. There has never been a human that's entered this planet outside of Adam and then Eve who came out of him. There's never been a human being that didn't come as a result of anything other than the union between a man's body and a woman's body. That's how God designed the system. And I don't care if they were separated and they did it in a test tube or they did it surgically or they did it by some other process. There is not a human being that's ever walked this planet that's come any other way than through a womb. That's the way God designed it. And he came into the door. He said, anyone who comes otherwise is a thief and a robber. He came in the doorway. That's the way he came. He came in through a young lady who'd never had relations with a man. It was the only miraculous virgin birth and immaculate conception that ever has and ever will take place. Amen. There were numerous other ladies that received the help of God and couples like Sarah, Abraham's wife, like Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, like Hannah, who prayed for that child, and God helped her. There were numerous that received the hand of God and the help of God. And we pray even to this day with, with, with ladies to, to accept and receive the help of God and, and the hand of God, and we watch him work. But there was only one who she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Almighty came on her, and therefore the holy thing that she bore was called the Son of God. But that wasn't when he came into existence. He was in existence from before time began, from the beginning of eternity, if there was a beginning. Uh, wasn't, just always existed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he stripped himself and laid those things aside and descended down into the human race and was born a, in, a, in a baby's body. Now, if you want to think that deep, I, I try not to go there, but if you want to think that deep, wouldn't you think that God coming out in a baby form would just like take off and run across the delivery room? <laughs> No, no, he's limited in every way like every other human. He has subjected himself to the limitations of humanity. Think about that. When you're God and you can be everywhere at the same time and now you're limited to time and place. You want to be in one place and you're limited by time. And he subjected himself to parents. The Bible says it. He subjected himself to earthly parents. He subjected himself to having to breathe and having to eat and having to drink and hydrate himself. He subjected himself to everything we go through so that, why? Why? So that he could be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and so that he could be a faithful intercessor for us. That's why. That's why. All because it was the will of God. If you think about his life, think about how many times Jesus said, I come not to do my own will. I am here to do the will of God of him that sent me. He came because it was the will of God. Prepare for me a body. I will go and do your will. What's the will of God? What is the will of God? It's salvation for every human being. And human beings couldn't save themselves because every human being has the exact same problem, the sin nature. We could take one person who volunteered, who held their hand up, said, I'll die for the human race, and no matter how wonderful a person she is, it wouldn't do any of us any good that she died because she has the same problem we do, the sin nature. Everyone after Eden and the individuals in Eden all have the same condition. So this one had to come from heaven. This one had to be perfect. This one had to be born in purity and perfection and in holiness without any spot, wrinkle, or blemish, without any sin, then would have to be tempted in every way like we are, but without sin. And so God came down because it was the will of God. And God subjected himself, came as a baby, was born, what we call Christmas morning, and, and, and what we rejoice in and commemorate and sing about. And then, because it was the will of God, ministered, 
went about teaching, preaching, healing every manner of sickness and disease. That was the threefold ministry of Jesus. Then he came down to the end of his ministry, and then right at the end, he goes to the garden called Gethsemane, and he kneels down there, and what does he pray? Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's why, that's the why behind Jesus. You know, we can say it, and, 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 and we don't mean it disrespectfully, but he didn't come here because he needed some time away. He didn't, he didn't need a vacation. He, he didn't have some travel points he needed to use up. He came here because it was the will of God for every human being to receive salvation unto everlasting life. For God, John 3.16, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. This was an expression of the love of God. That's the why behind Jesus it was the will of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is so submitted to the will of God that he didn't say, well, let me think about it. He didn't say, wow, the sacrifice is too great. He didn't say, no, I can't do it. The cost is too high. You'll have to find someone else. He didn't say, I can do it all, but that submitting to those human parents part, that, that's, just, that's, that's, that's just too much of a struggle for me. That, that, I, I just can't do that. He said, that's the will of God. Prepare me a body. I'll go. Death, see, see, the entire inspired Bible talks about his sacrifice, the 22nd Psalm, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the redemptive chapter, how challenging, how difficult, how he'd be whipped and bruised and beaten, how he'd be scourged, how he'd be rejected of men, how he'd be cursed and how he'd be mocked. He knew all of that. That didn't go into his decision as to whether or not he should obey the Lord. The only thing that went into his decision, and he is our example, he's our standard. The only thing that went into his decision was, if it's the will of God, I'll obey. If that's the will of God, that's what I'm going to do. He is our certainly example in love. He's our example in mercy. He's our example in purity. He's our example in devotion. And we have no other greater example in sacrificial obedience to the will of the Lord than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He left heaven and came to earth. Now, we can go back to Luke chapter 1. We can go back to Matthew chapter 1. And it only solidifies really the heart of, of, of what I'm sharing with you this morning, and that is to see that this was all done because it was the will of God. This was all done because it was the plan of God. This was not done somehow in response to some great thing that some human being had done. And I say that simply just as a gentle warning because sometimes we just get the impression that the Lord can't do anything without me. And the Lord just can't do anything unless I do my part. And, and if I'm not careful, there is, a, there is a divine cooperation between prayer and answered prayer. There is a divine cooperation between grace and faith. Grace is God's provision, and faith accepts and receives it. There is a divine connection between giving and receiving and sowing and reaping. But may we never, may we never get to thinking that everything the Lord does is as a result of us or what we do. Whether that's prayer or fasting or church attendance or forgiveness or love or intercession or anything else. What we see in these days are people who are surprised by the visitation of God. Look at Mary when in, in Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. You, 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 you look at Gabriel coming to her. Look at her response. Look at Joseph's response in Matthew chapter 1 when the same angel Gabriel came to him in a dream and talked to him. Look at, look at John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, when the angel came and said, you're going to have a son, and he's arguing with him. No, we're not. This is hardly, these are hardly people who are just standing at the ready and believing God. This isn't man's plan. It's God's plan. 
And here's what the Bible says, and marvelous in our eyes. And marvelous in our eyes. Oh, how great the mystery of faith. You know, it's not maybe how we would plan it and how maybe, maybe we would set it out, but this is the will of God. This is the will of God. And, and, and I look also at the timetable of Christ's coming that from the time the book of Malachi was completed and the Old Testament was wrapped up as a document and finished to the time that the first chapter of Matthew and first chapter of Luke came to being was 400 years. 400 years of what? 400 years of quiet, 400 years of silence, 400 years of maybe someone thinking, where is God anyway? How long is it going to be? 400 years. And I love Galatians 4 and verse 4. It says that Jesus came in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, and so on and so on. Now, whether you're aware of it or not, the second coming of Christ, uh, there, there's a pretty strong contingent of believers, Christians, that don't believe that Jesus can return and come back the second time until we make it ready for him. Like the second coming of the Lord's based on us. And there was a best-selling book called Reserved in Heaven Until... That, that purported that back in the 1990s. Jesus can't come back until we say it's okay. He's reserved in heaven until we do our part. We get everything set and we get ready. And, 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 and even today, there, there, there's a belief among many that the Lord will never return until more people get saved. Well, I know what I'd do if I was the devil. I would just, I would just keep as many people uh, out of the kingdom and keep them from getting saved. Then he'd never return. Now, you remember Galatians 4, 4 from just a minute ago? When did Jesus come? It wasn't when everybody figured out the date. How, who would have picked 4,004 years anyway? 4,004? That's how long it was from the creation to the coming of Christ. And every time I hear somebody say, well, it's got to be in 2020. It might be. Might be in 2019 yet. But I do know this, that Ephesians chapter 1 says, when he returns, it'll be in the fullness of time. And there's only one who holds the timepiece. Only one whose stopwatch matters. Only one who has that sand glass and knows when the last little piece of sand is going to trinkle through. And that's Jehovah God our Father. And our Bible says that none of the angels know the day or the hour, not even the Son knows that secret. And when God the Father says, the fullness of time has come, go back, return, then the Son is going to come the second time. Not because of our activity or our lack of activity. Not because of our state of readiness. Because Jesus taught us that half the church wouldn't even be ready and would miss his return. No, it's not based on us. It's based on the will of God and whenever he says the fullness of time is. So, that impels me and motivates me just to stay ready. I think of those people in the temple when Jesus was born. Simeon and, 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 and Anna. And, and you know what? They, they didn't have a clue when it would be. It just says they stayed there every day. She'd been over there, it says, for 80 years. I just like to just have that kind of gold star record on your church attendance. Never missed a day in 80 years. She's just waiting. She's just waiting. She's just waiting. She's just waiting. Simeon, he was at death's doorstep. And he held that Christ child and said, Now let your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. He had this witness inside of himself that, that I'm not going to die till I see the Lord's Christ. I'm not. And he went every day. He didn't know. But he was ready. He was ready. Can I, just, can I just encourage you? Just stay ready. Don't let life 
Don't let the uh, affairs of life, don't let the challenges of life sap you of the joy of knowing that the second coming, just like the first, when the fullness of time arrives, will come to pass because it is the will of God. It is the will of God. Now, in closing, I want to go back to one of the most unlikely of scriptures to meld into a, a pre-Christmas message, and that's the book of Job. Job is the book right before the Psalms. Psalms is pretty easy because you just let your Bible open up and it's right in the middle. Uh, and, and right before that is this book called Job. Uh, and, and, and in Job, the ninth chapter, Job asks this question, uh, and, and, and it's such an such a outstanding question. He, he answers and says, verse 2, I know it is so of a truth, but how can a man be right with God? The King James Bible says, how should a man be just with God? It's the same word, just, being the root of justified, which means being declared righteous. It's all talking about the nature. Your nature when you're, when, when, when you're unsaved, when you're not born again as a Christian, your nature is the nature of sin. That's why no human being could be cru crucified. No human being could be sacrificed for us. Because every human is in the same absolute category, and that is born in sin. Everyone. And so often, and I'm not sure how this developed, but our evangelistic, during our lifetime, I think it was just a little before our lifetime or, or, or during our lifetime, it just seemed like all of the attention in evangelism was come and get your sins forgiven. Come and ask the Lord to forgive your sins. Your sins are not the issue. Sin is the issue. See, your sins are your mistakes, your shortcomings, your faults, your failures, and, and what you've done contrary to God's will. But that's not the issue. The Lord doesn't come just to forgive your sins. Your sins could be forgiven in the Old Testament. Yes, they could. They could be forgiven in the Old Testament and were. Now, the issue is the nature, the nature of the spirit being the eternal part of you. You're a spirit, soul, and body, and the eternal part of you, before you come to Christ and before Christ comes into you, that nature is sin and death. And that nature is contrary to God, and that nature is not right in his sight. When you accept the gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ and his gifting to the earth, the Holy Spirit does this work on the inside of you that you can't do on your own. And you're changed from darkness to light, from death to life, from sin to righteousness. And then that becomes your nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 puts it this way. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creature. Old things pass away. And what old things? All your bills disappear? <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Huh? Uh huh? It's the shape of your nose change or your eye color or your hair? No. Not, none of the external things change. The thing that changes is your nature. The old man passes away and the nature of God comes in. And now, instead of being sin, you're righteous. Now, do you still ever sin after that? I've never met anybody that hasn't. I've never met anybody after the, maybe the thief on the cross. But if you live more than 10 minutes, uh, you're going to be tempted after you get saved. Then what? Then what? You just go and receive forgiveness for that sin by confessing it, and he's faithful and just to forgive you, 1 John 1, 9, and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, anything that's not right. But see, Jesus did not become sin so that we could just have our sins forgiven. Again, under the old covenant, you could receive that. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Where's that in our Bible? Amongst other places, 2 Corinthians 5.21. See, look at this scripture. It says that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Not sins. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
be made the righteousness of God in him. And so your nature has to change. So Job is asking this question, and Job answers and says, I know it is so of a truth, but how can a man be justified with God? How can a man be justified with God? I know it's so of a truth, but how can a man be right with God? Now, he says a lot of other things between there, but go down to verse 32, and he continues that thought. He says he's wise and hard, he's mighty in strength, he moves mountains, shakes the earth, all those other things. But he says, I know it's so of a truth, but how can a man be right with God? Verse 32, for he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman between us, that he might lay his hand upon us both. Now, I need somebody who can read. Quick, run up here. Run, jump. All right, I need somebody who can read. Uh, neither is there any daysman. What? See that little letter right there? What does it say daysman is? Mediator. Mediator. And so, thank you. And, and so, so what he says is, I know what you're saying is true. And, and, and the other men there, they were talking to Job. And he said, I know what you're saying is true, but how can a man be right with God? How can a man be made right with God? He's not a man like I am. He's not a man like I am. He's God, and I'm man. He's perfect, and I'm imperfect. He's pure, and I'm impure. He's holy, and I'm unholy. He's righteous, and I'm created in sin. How could a man ever be right with God? I need, I, I, I need, need a volunteer real quick uh, because you're, you're, you're going to play man. You're going to play Job. And, and Job says, I'm way down here, lower. Job is way down there. And, 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 and Job looks up at, 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 come here, God. And, 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 and right up here, way up here. Like you're way up higher than God. And Job is, is he, he's, he's, he's crying out. And he's, he, this is the cry of the whole human race. I find myself down here. I find myself in this sinful condition. I find myself imperfect. I find myself impure. I find myself in this unholy state. And I don't like it. And I'd like to be right with God. But how could I ever be right with God? God's not a man like I am. I'm way down here in sin, and I'm way down here. I was born this way. I, I can't find a way to be right with God. God is up there. God is holy, and I'm unholy. God is perfect, and I'm imperfect. God is pure, and I'm impure. God is righteous, and I'm in sin. How could a man be right with God? It would take a daysman. It would take a mediator. It would take somebody who could stand between heaven and earth. It would take somebody who could put his hand on God because he is God and put his hand on man because he is man. And how could that ever happen? How could it ever happen? It would take God himself. And that's exactly what happened. God himself said, prepare for me a body. I'll go down there and do your will. And he descended from heaven, stripped everything off of himself, became one of us, but never sin was tempted in every way like we are but never sinned and stood between God and put a hand out toward God and stood between man and put a hand on man and stretched out those two arms and God made him sin for the benefit of man and any man accepting what he did becomes the nature of God in through him. He became the mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's the plan of God. <coughs> that's the will of God. And that's what took place in what we know as Christmas. He left heaven. He said, prepare for me a body, and I'll go and I'll do your will. He said he, he, that, that, that was his whole ministry, to do the will of God the Father. And he came not so we could have a holiday. He came not so we could have a great dinner. He came not so we could compete with all of our neighbors to see whose light show was best. 
He came not so we could exchange gifts. And for me, for like the 55th year, try to figure out how to wrap those little guys and make them look nice and just use tape. For God so loved the world, he gave us gift bags. <laughs> no, the will of God wasn't that we have a holiday. The will of God wasn't even that we celebrate. It's okay that we do. It's okay that we commemorate. It's okay that we are grateful and thankful. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came because God so loved every member of the human race. Boy and girl, man and woman, young and old, middle age, single or married, every race, every creed, every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. And he needed someone to go who was perfect and who could stay perfect. Who could stand between mankind and God and stretch a hand out to both and put his hand on each. And be the mediator. And that's what our Bible says he is to us. The mediator between God and man. There's only one way to come to God. All throughout the religious world, there are toted religious works, good works, righteous works, penance, all sorts of things that will bring you to God. Join our group, become a member of our church. No, that's not how you get accepted and received by God. There's only one road to heaven. There's only one way. Jesus said it, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through He's the only mediator. He said in John 10, he said, I am the door if anyone comes through me. Acts 4.12 says there's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus the Christ. Now he's the mediator. Job was right. How can a man be right with God? We're in sin. We're imperfect. We're impure and we're unholy. How can a man be right with God? It would take a mediator who could stand between us and God. And he came for that very purpose because that's the will of God. Aren't you so glad he did? And we're going to have a great, great celebration of Christmas next Sunday morning. Sing some more Christmas carols. Rejoice in his birth. Talk about the, the, the angels that, that shone through heaven. And the manger. And the shepherds. And in that following week, the wise men. The wise men who came. But today, Lord, we focus, let's all stand. Today we focus our hearts, Lord, on the reason that he came. The reason that he came is because it was your will, Heavenly Father. We pray it again. We pray your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. May your will be our will. And may your will be what we always seek. Regardless of what that means to us. May we exemplify the life of our Savior, Jesus. And just express that if that's your will, I will. Yes, I will. Whatever your will. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that brings salvation. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your great love where with you loved us. Thank you that the gift of eternal life, salvation unto everlasting life, is not extended to only a few, but is presented to anyone and everyone to receive as a gift. Thank you that we don't earn or work for or deserve, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Savior. Thank you for our service this morning and thank you for our time together. Thank you for speaking to us by your Holy Spirit in the inner chambers of our hearts and through your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.